Hello, everyone. I'm, my name is Edna Adan Ismail, and I'm sending you this message from Hargeisa, Somaliland. Uh, it's a country in the Horn of Africa, former British Somaliland protectorate, uh, and a country that at one time united with neighboring former Italian Somalia that you may all have heard about. Uh, Somaliland separated from Somalia in 1991. We have been peaceful and stable since that time for the past 30 years. And thank God we have been able to rebuild our country, uh, not only rebuild what had been destroyed during the war, but also rebuild a nation, our health services, our education, and the, uh, the facilities that make uh, the environment livable and safe for human habitation. Uh, I think you will probably be shown a map of where my country is, so this way it, it facilitates the geographical location. And I have also shared some pictures uh, with the organizers that may show you what um, the operations that we do, some of the um, you know, how, you know, facilities that were destroyed, or where the hospital is, and so on about anesthesia. Well, when a nation's health services have been leveled to the ground, there is no anesthesia. And when I first came back to my country, Somaliland, after I retired from a long career with the United Nations, WHO, I found my country with no functioning maternity services, uh, no professional trained anesthetists. There were four or five, at most, uh, anesthesia technicians who had been taught to, to give anesthesia, either local or usually ketamine, uh, during the war in the, in the battlefield. So it's people who were giving anesthesia because of the emergency situation. The first people who helped me to help us to give some training to our anesthetists was the uh, Ministry of Health of Ethiopia, who allowed us to send four of our technicians to Ethiopia for two months training each, so that they could gain experience in the big Black Lion Hospital in Addis Ababa. This was really the beginning of, of our steps towards getting safe anesthesia for our people. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity, that valuable opportunity that was given to us at that time. And then we had Tropical Health and Education Trust from the United Kingdom, from King's College Hospital, who came to train some nurse, nurses uh, in some in critical care and anesthesia. So they were training health officers, uh, mainly on long, you know, distance learning with occasional visits from people coming uh, from King's College. That was, these were the humble beginnings of how we could find some people to give a certain amount of safe anesthesia. We had emergencies. We had deliveries, we had C-sections to perform, and it was not always very easy to, to do any of those things uh, unless a spinal anesthesia was possible. Um, and then it was with the kind support of the Fistula Foundation in the US when we started our very first training for nurse anesthetists with support from Kijabe Hospital in Kenya. And what we did is we, we welcomed and we appreciated and we were grateful to have the training guidelines, the curriculum, and the trainers from Kenya who gave us the same training that they gave to their nurse anesthetists at Kijabe Hospital. And with their external examiners, with their, ex ex uh, with their lecturers, we were able to train our very first nurse anesthetists, and we trained seven. 
and this was so successful and their training was so so safe and so good and so much appreciated that we trained another 14. This gave us 21 nurse anesthetists for a country, Somaliland, a country that is as big as England and Wales combined. 21 anesthetists. A country with a population of 4 million plus population. A country where the infrastructure, where the health services had been destroyed and we were trying to at least get some surgical facilities in some of the regional hospitals of our country, Somaliland. Uh, well, when you have to do something and people are dying, you do the best that you can with what you have. And I am so grateful for those who helped us during those very dark and difficult years when we needed anesthetists, when we needed people to be able to intubate a patient, when we needed people to help us resuscitate a newborn, and we could not because we did not have the skills and we did not have the facilities. Today, we have eight regional hospitals. We have district hospitals. And the 21 anesthetists that we trained with the help of Kijabe Hospital and the help of um, uh, the Fistula Foundation and with the technical support of the Medica, who also provided us, generously provided us with 13 new Dia Medica anesthesia machines so that we could place a machine in a hospital and at least have one or two trained anesthetists for that facility. So we, we got on the map of Somaliland and developed like you would develop a war strategy. Where do we need these machines to go? Who is going to look after those machines? Who is going to use them? How are they going to keep records? How are we going to keep track of how safe and functioning these machines are? And we're very grateful. With these new machines and with the trained uh, anesthetists that we have, Somaliland is able to provide safe anesthesia in a much, much better and bigger way than we were able to, let's say, 15 years ago. Um, I'm a midwife by profession, and this is really what brought me back to Somaliland, to try and help a nation with at least safe maternity care. And after I had spent a long career with the United Nations, and I have had served in various senior and diplomatic positions, this was the least I could do for my people. Come back, share whatever knowledge, whatever resources I had, whatever savings I had made, and whatever time God gives me to share this time with our people. Now, an individual cannot do much. So the strategy that I developed, I used, and I'm so grateful that I have been very successful in this, is to start training um, nurses, training midwives, training lab technicians, training pharmacists, and now we train doctors, and we train uh, dentists and public health professionals and nutritionists, and we are about to start on agriculture and veterinary health. So knowledge is what we have chosen to focus on. Um, so that gives you a little background of where we started from. The maternal mortality of the people of Somaliland was the highest the third highest in the world, even before the war, even before the 11 year civil war we had with Somalia, our women had the third highest maternal mortality rate. But you can imagine the maternal mortality rate, how low it had become when all health facilities had become destroyed, when health professionals had become killed because of the war. Today, we have trained over a thousand midwives for Somaliland. We have trained 
almost 300 medical doctors for some other, in, in several different universities. The first doctors will be graduating from the N. Aden University only next year. But we have been offering space for the professional rotation of medical students who come from Boroma, who come from Hargeisa University uh, and other partners. We also have been welcoming students, medical students, who come on a rotation uh, from abroad. We, we get a good number who come from the United States or from Canada, from Europe, from the UK. And I think we've had medical students and volunteers come from almost every continent. Oh, I'm, I cannot forget the Australian Doctors for Africa, because the Australian Doctors for Africa uh, send us resources, send us doctors, send us trainers, and also send us supplies uh, and give scholarships to some of our top students. So with this collective world support that we have received from so many different directions, today the maternal mortality rate of our women is going down. And if I give you an example of what we have been able to achieve on this hospital, the Enna Hospital, built on a once killing ground, a former military parade ground that had become a killing ground during the war and which had also become a trash dump before it became a hospital. We have performed thousands of surgical operations. Thank God and so grateful to the surgeons who come to us for surgical camps to do surgery uh, regularly to repair cleft lips and palates. And we've done hundreds uh, of cleft lips and palate repairs over the years. We are the only hospital where we insert shunts for children with hydrocephaly or hydrocephalus. Uh, we insert shunts. We follow up those children. We do the head measurements to see if the head is going down. We follow the development of those children after they have the, the, the shunts inserted. Um, and it is because we have wonderful professors and doctors and surgeons who have been coming to us on a regular basis every six weeks, all the way from North Carolina uh, or from other parts of the United States who come to us on a regular basis to do these surgeries and also train and train our surgeons. It's this international support, it's this international partnership, partnership and this international um, you know, desire to give us a hand and support us and share their knowledge and skills with us that we can boast whatever achievements that we have made. Without them, we would not have been able to do a fraction of what we have been able to achieve. A very important training that we do uh, that requires anaesthetists is that some, uh, the Edna Hospital started the very first postgraduate, one-year postgraduate training for doctors in obstetrics and neonatal care. Because these junior doctors, once trained, are usually sent to district hospitals where they become everything the community needs. They become, somebody breaks an arm, they're the orthopedic surgeon. A woman needs a C-section, they're the obstetrician. Somebody has an injury, they're the general surgeon. So these young doctors uh, get one year training at the Edna Hospital, at the Edna University. They do normal pregnancy, normal deliveries, manage labor, manage the, you know, the placenta, manage you know, different presentations, prodalic presentations, can deliver a breach, and also are taught how to perform safe cesarean sections. We are now doing the fourth group in training. And once these doctors finish their one year training, they are sent out. And it is because they have access to safe anesthesia that they are able to save the lives that they have saved. 
we have delivered 29,000 babies a day in the hospital since we opened in 2002. We have sadly lost 73 mothers. 73 mothers uh, for 26,000 deliveries gives us a maternal mortality of 250, 260 per 100,000. Very high. But when we know that the maternal mortality rate of the women of Somaliland was 1,600 per 100,000, the number has dramatically dropped. But there is no room for complacency because those 73 mothers who we could not save because they were brought too late, because they did not have the proper prenatal care that they deserved, that they should have had before coming or being brought to us or being referred to us or being sent to us, those 73 mothers have also left children behind. So although the figure, the maternal mortality has, has dropped from 1,600 to 250, it's still a human life. It's still the mother that could have been saved. And where does the community needs to change, our community needs to change, is encourage prenatal care. When the world thinks about surgery and anesthesia, uh, we take for granted, uh, I took for granted so many things when I worked in Europe or in America. But in Somaliland, there are certain things that you just cannot take for granted. Um, a patient may go to a hospital needing surgery, emergency or, or, or uh, booked, but there may be a hospital it may have an operating theater, but it may not have water. It may not have electricity. It may have a backup generator. It may not have the fuel. Or there may be a belt broken in the generator or something, or the technician did not update the, you know, the machine or did not service it. Uh, they may not have water. We are in Somaliland. It's a, it's a dry country. Sometimes it doesn't rain for a couple of years water becomes the most precious commodity. So if you cannot wash an environment, you cannot wash an operating theater, you cannot wash instruments and equipment and, and gowns and, and the facility itself, it cannot become safe for patients. So we may have the water and the electricity and the facility may be in place, but we may not have the trained health professionals. We may not have the trained instrument nurses. Uh, whoever is there may not know the difference between the different types of sutures we use, the instruments we use, the type of needles we use. Uh, is it a round body needle? Is it a cutting needle? Um, so there are so many things that make surgery safe. The skills, the equipment, the facilities itself, the roads, the accessibility. Some of our roads are, are not accessible when it rains because of the mud. It's not accessible when it doesn't rain because of the dust. Um, so there are challenges that, that we need to face in developing countries that need to be taken into consideration. Um, we may have a facility that works, but unless we have the trained health professionals who are trained to the best possible standards of safety, uh, ethics, compassion, efficiency, focused, dedicated health professionals, patients will never get the kind of service they need to have from us and which they deserve to have. So this is why I, I spent a whole lot of my energy and time to start training programs for nurses, for midwives, for pharmacists, for lab technicians. Where we, would we be today if we did not have lab technicians who can you know, do a, 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 a blood you know, cross match and get a blood grouping for us and do a blood transfusion for us, where would we be if we had no uh, lab technicians who can give us a blood picture, who can give us a culture and sensitivity test? Where would we be if we did not have 
the um, the physiotherapist. When we do surgery, uh, you know, contracted joints, and we 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 extend and we do skin grafts and we we open up the joint, a joint that had not been in use for years. Uh, that 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 limb needs to be rehabilitated and needs to become functional again. So it's a whole lot of teamwork, and this is what we focus on. And this is why I also built, after I built the hospital, built the university. So we can train doctors, we can train nurses, we can train pharmacists, we can train dentists. Um, we're going. We have come a long way. Much progress has been made in the past. 15, 20 years, but we still have a long way to go. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the world for all that it has done for us and with us to help us train our health professionals, to give us support and facilities and, 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 and uh, supplies that they did not need, that they sent to us. I cannot forget and forget to thank the Fistula Foundation because without them, we would not have trained our anaesthetists. I cannot forget to thank the Australian Doctors for Africa who come to us, send us teachers, give us scholarships, give us supplies, um, give us their, 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 their friendship and their, their technical and their professional support. I cannot forget to thank the Tropical Health and Education Trust who were the first to come out to my hospital when I opened the hospital in 2002. How can I forget um, you know, direct relief who sends us supplies and equipment? How can I forget the surgeons, the senior surgeons and professions, professionals who come to us every six weeks to do surgical camps for us, to repair lifts and cleft palates, uh, to, to train our, our surgeons and our staff, uh, to teach our doctors how to insert shots for children with hydrocephaly. Um, the world has been supportive and of us. Without the world, we would not have been able to do whatever we have, we have done. And I, I hope that you will go to the website of the hospital and university. I hope that you will maybe find time to read my, the, the, the story of my life's journey, my, my biography, which has been published by Harper Collins in the UK, A Woman of Firsts carries the, you know, my challenges that, that I faced, if I had any successes, how they, they happened, and learn from the mistakes that I made and, and hopefully not make the same ones. Um, this has been uh, a wonderful, ex you know, people think that I have given something after I retired from the UN, donated, you know, whatever I, you know, God had given me to build a hospital university, what I get in return is so much more valuable. The thousands of health professions that we have trained, the anaesthetists and all the others that we've trained, the thousands who are scattered throughout Somaliland and around the world, because quite a few of the people we trained are now working elsewhere. Some I know some are in California, I know some are in the UK, I know some are in Saudi Arabia, uh, but the bulk of them is here and working in very isolated locations in Somaliland. And I feel so blessed that I could do that. And I cannot end my message to the world with my thank you to everybody, to the volunteers who've come to us, but also to my late father, who was a, a, a strong role model for me, who taught me compassion and professionalism, who taught me ethics. Whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. And don't forget, the human factor. Don't forget that that patient, that poor, smelly, unconscious patient is a human being and deserves your attention, your compassion, your professional support. Um, I hope that this message comes through. I know we're having challenges with the internet, but I hope my message comes through. And my final word is thank you to everybody who've supported us from near and from far. Thank you.